Thank you for listening to Gateway City Church Online today. We hope this message will be a blessing to you and draw you closer to God. Now let's go into the service for today's message. We lift up your name in this place, Lord. We honor you, Jesus. Our healer. Our helper. Thank you, Lord, for your love, Lord. Thank you for your peace, Lord. Thank you for your touch on our lives, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We worship you in this place. We thank you, Lord, that your promise is that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, that you are there in the midst of them, and you are here today. Jesus, we ask you to touch people, heal people, save people, free people, lift people, change people, Lord. Do that in this place today. We expect it and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time. Give the Lord a shout this morning. Hallelujah. Good job, worship team. Hallelujah. Unto him be glory. Unto him be honor. Be seated, guys. Give it up for the worship team, Robbie Brea, all you guys. Thank you, Robbie and Brea. It's good to see you back home. There's no place like San Jose, I just want to remind you. Nashville might be a close second, but we love you guys, and it's good to see them. Amen. Praise God. The Lord spoke to me while we were worshiping that during this message, uh, people are going to be physically healed. So I'm excited about that. And if you need healing, I want you just to open your heart, because I'm going to share some things today that I believe are a little bit unique, a little bit different, maybe timely. Maybe timely for where you're at in your life and certainly uh, will help you to love and help you walk in freedom and help you receive healing. Before I get to that message, there is a teaching outline on the chair next to you. You can see where we're going to be going. Uh, But I want to mention a couple of things that I think would please the Lord. First of all, there's a young lady um, that we know about who is placing her baby up for adoption. This is a loving choice that she's making for this child. She's a college student. She is not ready to embrace, you know, the high expectation and uh, responsibility of um, raising her child, and she's giving it up for adoption in a very loving way, which is a courageous thing. And this young lady needs a place to stay. She has part-time work. She is a college student. And if you are interested in providing or maybe helping a young woman in this situation, Um, please see me after the service and I will give you the information that you need. Or you can contact Valerie at realoptions.net, Valerie at realoptions.net. I believe the body of Christ uh, will come alongside a young person like this and help her out. How many think that would please the Lord? I'm also very excited about something that's underway in our church. You've heard it announced a few times but I just want to take a minute to underline the importance of it. And that is our Racial Reconciliation Forum, which will be taking place a week from this Wednesday night, August the 2nd, here in our cafe. Racial Reconciliation Forum is a place for the followers of Jesus Christ to come together and have courageous conversations about differences, diversity, and healing in the body of Christ. This uh, coming Uh, Not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, August the 2nd, Pastor Chandler Cleveland, who is one of our pastors, will be uh, facilitating the discussion. And a couple of the things they're going to be mentioning uh, is how to discover God's vision for reconciliation in the body of Christ at large and in the local church, to understand what diversity from a Christian standpoint, diversity from a Christian standpoint, could look like in a community such as ours, in a church setting to understand the different elements of diversity. And, and it's, not, uh, it's not just a few things that create diversity, but there are many things to understand that from God's perspective and to find out how we can engage in God's divine plan to create an atmosphere at Gateway where we can all participate in the biblical ministry of reconciliation. Everyone say reconciliation. reconciliation. That means we get okay with our differences and perspectives and views, and that there's a place for that in the body of Christ. In fact, I think the body of Christ is the only place where there's enough love, there's enough healing, and there's enough light 
to really bring us all together. So an important conversation. This is a part of our vision and something that we really want to provide leadership on. So join us uh, a week from Wednesday at the racial reconciliation gathering, all right? Is anybody happy here today? Oh, good. What do you think of these graduates and all these young... Good job, guys. God is working. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody here in the sanctuary. If you're joining us online, what an honor to have you. And I'm glad we can be together around the Word of God, the Bible, which is our guidebook for all of life. This is where we get our light. This is where we get our direction. This is where our answers come to life's most complicated questions. And we've been in a series of talks here at Gateway, kind of a longer conversation called Heart and Soul. We've done six together, and we even produced a little book called Heart and Soul that many of you got engaged with, and I thank you for that. But today's kind of a bonus message where I'm going to just add one more thought, just one more word on this issue of having a servant's heart. And it really came to me that one of the main things that stops people from serving is offense. I can't tell you how many people got started with Jesus, loving him, reaching out, serving, helping their neighbor, helping their friend, finding a place of service and ministry within the body of Christ and in the workplace, and then something happens that offends them, and they stop. They stop serving. They stop growing, they stop giving, they stop following Jesus, it just stops. It's a serious thing. And I promise you, it's something that all of us will deal with if we haven't already. For example, I myself have offended people. And I also have experience being offended. That's right. I have been angry and had problems and wrestled with unforgiveness, just like like everybody. What I notice is that in this process of serving the Lord and and giving our lives to God, that one thing will stop us just about quicker than anything else, which is when we get our nighty in a knot, (laughs) we get ticked off at somebody. And by the way, I'm not making fun of this. I'm I'm trying to use a little humor because I I want us all to loosen up and then I want to hit you. I want to hit you good. (laughs) But to understand that what happens is In a marriage or in a church relationship, when an issue rises up and we don't do the right thing with it, the marriage often stops in place, the relationship stops in place, and I know married people, and I know church people, and I know people that were engaged in wonderful ways with relationship and with life and with the gospel, and it stopped because an issue arose, and that's what I want to talk about because I care about your life. I want good things to happen in your life. I believe good things can happen in your life. But this is one thing that we need to look at and just talk about and say, you know what? I'm not going to let this happen in my life. I'm going to keep going for the Lord all the days of my life. Amen? So the idea of our talk today is at cultivating what I would call an unoffendable heart. An unoffendable heart, cultivating an unoffendable heart really pleases the Lord and will bring us a lifetime of peace. I've noticed that people that wrestle with offense, and believe me, that's all of us on one level or another. There's, there's nobody here that hasn't wrestled with the issue of offense. That we, when offense comes into our life, our peace just goes out the window. That's when we start losing sleep and struggling and we're angry and we get stomach problems and we, we get tight muscles and we get migraine headaches and because there's something that's blocking the peace of God in our lives. Let's come back to that beautiful place of peace and understand what it means today to, to be unoffendable in heart. Let's look at a couple of scriptures and then we'll talk through some of the issues. Ezekiel chapter 36 a famous prophetic word, and it's about the new birth, and it's about how God will change a person's life. And Ezekiel looked forward to it, and he speaks for God, and God says, and I will give you a new heart, and I will plant a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a what? A tender 
Circle that word tender. I will give you a tender heart, a responsive heart. The work of God in our lives takes place in our hearts. Church is not about changing the outside. Relationship with God is not about style or appearance or outward manifestation. What God wants to do is deep in the inside of our heart and soul. And God said, that tendency to be stony, rocky, hard, and cold that is human beings, I want to touch that place. And I want that to be soft again. If you're sitting here today, you should put the dipstick into your heart right now and say, am I, am I tender in heart or am I, am I feeling kind of hard? Am I cold or am I, am I warm? God wants to touch that place in your life. Psalm 119 verse 165 talks about the peace that God wants to give us. Great peace. Everyone say great peace. Wow. I'd like to live in great peace. I, I don't want to live in stress. I don't want to live in anger. I don't want to live on a low boil, yes. always just a half step from blowing. I want to live in great peace. Great peace have they which love thy law, and watch this, nothing shall offend them. Do you believe there's a place in God that you could live where nothing blows you off track, where nothing becomes an issue that stops your progress. Great peace have they who love the Lord and nothing will derail them, nothing will offend them, nothing will hurt them. Let's talk about this issue of how do we deal with offenses and where do offenses come in our lives? First of all, an offense is any displeasing action or attitude by another person which we allow, key word, allow, which we allow to hinder us. In other words, living this kind of life with a soft heart and, and unoffendable, that doesn't mean that people aren't going to be offensive. I guess you've noticed by now <laughs> that people do crazy stuff. And, and so the question is not, you know, how do we get people to stop doing crazy stuff? The question is how do we stop ourselves from being hindered by crazy stuff that goes on? That's what being unoffendable is. It means I'm not going to take the occasion of your... I'm not going to let... I would be crazy to let your crazy make me crazy. So I opt out. <laughs> I do not cooperate. I will not give you the power to hinder me emotionally. But some of us are so used to just reacting to how everything happens in life that we don't, know, we don't know there's another way. The point of the message is today, there's another way for you. You don't have to live in pain. You don't have to lack peace. You can make a choice to have an unoffendable heart. Well, where do all the triggers and offenses come from in us? I have a short list here. It's on your notes. Let me just move quickly through this. You know, there are oversights and errors that people make. I mean, you know, somebody forgot your birthday or they, 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 they uh, you know, overlooked something important. They should have greeted you. They didn't greet you. Sometimes that, those can be uh, normal things, errors, you know. For example, uh, you know, Jordan did a great job a couple of Sundays ago preaching and, uh, and somebody wrote me a message. Actually, it's Pastor Chandler, if I can just out him right now. He wrote me a nice letter and he said, hey, Jordan did a great job. Uh, he said that, you know, the message was great. He said, I really saw the words of his mother in that message. <laughs> Amen. 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 Who do you think taught him everything he knows? <laughs> it wasn't his mama. But. So instantly, and you know, what you have to know is, what you have to know is, Whenever I preach on anything, God tests me. So here I am going to preach on offense. I didn't really get upset, but I had to laugh out loud. His mother. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oversights and errors. Okay, second on the list. Personality clashes. Maybe by now you've noticed that personalities vary. There's almost no one exactly like you. And when you meet someone like you, you love them. Yes. 
but almost nobody is like you. If you're quiet, you're probably surrounded with noisy people. If you're noisy, you're probably surrounded with quiet people and so on and so forth. And those are relational friction. Uh, and that's, we also call that marriage, okay? And that's, <laughs> that's something that, you know, is, is a part of the sandpaper that God is using. But it is also an occasion uh, for you and I to become upset when people are different, when they think different, when they have a different opinion, different perspective, and we just need them to see it the way we see it. Otherwise, we can't sleep at night. And, and you've got you've to let that go. Then there's misplaced expectations. So many of us get offended when we expected something to happen that didn't happen. I prayed with somebody just after the service today, and they said, boy, this, this message just really set me free because she said, I realized I had been expecting this, 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 and this, and I really had no right to expect it. Nobody knew that I was expecting it, so they let me down in that, and that... She said, I'm free. I said, that's wonderful. Let your expectations be in God. Don't put your needs on your husband, your wife, your kid, your neighbor, your pastor, your teacher, your politician, your leader. Don't put your expectations in people because they'll let you down every time. Put your expectation in God, and then you'll be able to deal with things uh, much better, right? So Misplaced expectations are a problem. Then sins and injustices, of course. When we sin against each other, if, it, if a husband cheats on his wife, that's offensive. If, uh, if somebody robs or steals or is aggressive or hateful toward another person, sin and injustice will cause, an, will cause the opportunity. It's an occasion for offense, but it doesn't mean that you have to be offended. There's another way, and we'll talk about that. And then the last level of this, which is something I think we often miss, is that spirit of offense. You can actually pick up someone else's offense. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what voices you allow into your head. Be careful what conversations you're a part of. Because it's amazing how one, what makes one person angry can, like a virus, infect us. And then, and then we're carriers, and we're upset, and we're not sleeping, and we're angry, and we're seeing that guy that we heard about, and... And then we just feel like, well, I got to tell somebody else. And I have seen epidemics of offense wash through families, wash through churches. I believe an epidemic of offense is washing through our nation right now. It's not healthy. A lot of our conversations right now are not healthy. We're just angry and offended and we're beefing and... And, the, and it doesn't solve the problem, does it? It doesn't really solve the problem. What it does is it gives us knots in our stomach and it keeps us from sleeping at night. And it kind of makes our hearts hard, a little more stony. We get suspicious and angry and people that see things differently, suddenly there's a problem. And this is the thing that comes in and hinders that peace that we're supposed to have and that joy and that love that's supposed to be flowing through us. So it's an issue. And I just want to mention quickly, when it comes to national problems or national conversations, let me just throw out there that we all want justice, but where does justice come from? Justice does not come from offense. Actually, justice comes from loving the truth. Justice comes when we sit at the feet of the Lord, we understand his ways and say, it's not supposed to be like that, it's supposed to be like this. And great peace have they who love God's way. It doesn't make them angry, it makes them peaceful to love God's way. And then we become reconcilers and workers for peace, having the greatest message that ever has been shared anywhere, which is the gospel of reconciliation and peace. There's hope for us, guys. We don't have to live angry. We don't have to live offended. Great peace will they have who love the Lord. And this peace needs to touch your marriage. It needs to touch your family, and it needs to touch your neighborhood. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Now, Jesus talked about the devastating effects of offense, and he nailed it as a sign of the last days. Jesus was a Savior, is our Savior. He is Lord. He is a healer, but he was also a prophet. And he knew 2,000 years ago 
exactly what would be happening in these last days that we live in today. He called it like this in Matthew 24. Many will become offended. They will betray one another and they will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That's the heart issue. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom, the message of reconciliation, the message of the gospel, which is sin can be forgiven and relationship, namely our relationship with God, can be healed. The gospel. Sin can be forgiven and our relationship can be healed. That gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. What God is saying here is that I have the message, I have the, I have the one and only solution to heal the nations. And history culminates with the message of the gospel, healing and reconciling our most important relationship, which is to God, but that also affects our relationship with each other. Days of betrayal, craziness, offense, anger, hatred, all the, all the mess that we're living in now. And the gospel comes and addresses that. The gospel is our greatest hope because it's the thing that can change our hearts. Now, if we look at these words, they're kind of scary. Like, I don't want to live in a day like that. And yet I think I do. I think I do live in a day just like that. It's eerily accurate. And if you study the structure of this prediction that Jesus made, it's like dominoes. There's a sequence here. First this, then this, then this, then this. And it's a warning. And look carefully with me at that verse. And again, I've got this written down for you in your, in your notes. There's a sequence that goes on. First, betrayal. You know, betrayal, when we're offended, uh, when, we're, when, when that issue comes into a relationship, it becomes very easy for us to betray. How do we betray? We say something about someone when they're not there. We're mad, we're offended, and so we let that knife just kind of slip into their back, and it's a betrayal. Now, sometimes we use Christian code language. This is all for purposes of prayer. But, <laughs> but did you know... And what that is, it's, it's aggression. We, we weaponize our feelings. And we use them to hurt others. It's a form of betrayal. But it goes on. Then there's hatred, which is open contempt for other people. Now, the Bible clearly says, you know, if we hate our brother, the love of God is not in us. So we have to deal with any form of hatred toward any other people. Even your worst enemy, even the person that abused you, even the person that uh, tried to destroy your life, if you allow that hatred to live inside your heart, then it, it is, that's the process of your heart becoming stone cold, driving God's love out of your heart and allowing hatred in there. There's a different way. Deception, Jesus said. They will betray, they will hate, and then false prophets will arise and deceive many. This is a part of the, this is a part of the sequence because when our hearts get hard through offense, we allow hatred and anger to build up, we will buy and believe anything. We become so deceivable. We become so, we become bait for the lies because we've lost that tender place in our heart and now we'll listen to things about other people. We'll listen to things about God. We'll listen to things about the Bible and God's people and and. Suddenly, things that aren't true are starting to sound very true to us because our heart has lost its sensitivity. The sequence goes on to spiritual uh, lawlessness, rather. After deception, we find lawlessness. Once a person is deceived, they come to a place of lawlessness, which is an open disregard for proper boundaries. So it's when a person is so angry and mad that they finally say, you know what, the rules don't apply to me. I can do what I want to do because 
I'm angry. I was hurt. It was wrong. Now we start to justify. We've allowed deception to come into our lives. And we'll actually even get in God's face. We'll get in one another's face. And we start we to say, hey, the laws don't apply to me. I'm taking this into my own hands. And finally, spiritual collapse. So our hearts then, by that point, all the last domino has fallen. We've lost our relationship with God. We don't look anything like Jesus Christ. We don't have anything like the tenderness of his heart. And how did it happen? It happened because we, we allowed something to slip in to offend us and hinder us. And it really didn't change the world for us to cooperate with that lie. It only changed us. But the promise is, I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a new spirit. I'll take that stony heart out of you, and I'll give you a heart that is tender and responsive to me. How many want a tender and responsive heart? So how do we get there? Let's have that conversation. There's three things I can think about, about receiving an unoffendable heart, how to be an unoffendable person. Number one, I would say, choose to cultivate Christ-like, Christ-like tenderness. We all want to be like Jesus. We're, that's what makes us Christians. We're following him. Well, what's he like? Well, he's tender. Jesus is tender. He's loving. He's forgiving. And here the apostle Paul says in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, be kind to each other. Tender hearted, not that stone heart, tender hearted forgiving. Now those two words come together because you can't forgive unless you're tender hearted. And if you don't forgive, you won't be tender hearted. Those two just work together like peanut butter and jelly. All right, you just, if you're tender, you forgive, and if you forgive, you stay tender. I would like to challenge the married couples. I would like to challenge the brothers and sisters. I'd like to challenge people that think differently and see life differently to pursue tender hearted emotion toward each other, openness, right? Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you, and He's forgiven you and me of a lot. And aren't we glad? So, so there's that tenderness. We all have that opportunity every day to be hard-hearted or tender-hearted. When somebody overlooks us or trespasses against us, even if they attack us, we can still choose tenderness. We don't have to choose, you know, ugly. We can choose beauty. The Lord's promise is that he's given us a soft new heart. And if we've received Jesus, that tenderness of the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. You really have access to the tender love of God, and it's there. And despite all your pain, there is a heart on the inside of you that, that is ready to be tenderized. So in your pursuit of following Jesus, don't harden, but soften toward relationships, even the painful ones. Number two, if we're going to be, receive an unoffendable heart, I think it's a question of choosing to forgive and choosing to reconcile. Forgiveness is a choice. Reconciliation is a choice. And by the way, you can't be offended without cooperating with that. Nobody can offend you without your cooperation. Nobody can offend you without your, without your permission. You, ha- you have to buy into that, right? Right? To have an unoffendable heart doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen to you. It just means you're not going to buy into the process of allowing a hindrance to crop up in your your world. Look at the words of 1 Peter. Peter followed Jesus closely. He made a lot of mistakes, but boy, did he understand what it was all about. He said, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with one another. That's what I like about reconciliation. It gives me a chance to listen to something different than what I'm thinking and to be sympathetic toward it, right? Dad, how about that first time you stayed with the kids all day long? You didn't know what your wife was going through, did you? (laughs) But suddenly you saw life from her perspective. Everyone say sympathy. Well, it's important to see things the way other people see it. It says, love each other as brothers and sisters. Wow. 
And here's our word again. Be what? There it is again. Why is this so important? Why, why does Jesus want us to be so fluffy? <laughs> so poetic? So sweet? Why, why is that important? Because when we're not sweet, the only other option is hard-hearted. And that means there's a lot of hindrances in our marriages, friendships, and so, we, so the issue is back on our heart, the pressure's back on our heart to allow God to change our heart. Change the heart, change the world. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate. Don't one-up each other with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a machete. No, is that what it says? No. <laughs> What does it say? Pay him back with a, I bless you. Can I help you with that? I want to speak kindly to you. Uh, that is what God has called you to do. And if we do that, he will grant us a blessing. Offense is a choice. And so is forgiveness. Nobody can offend us without our permission and consent. And we can choose every day to forgive and bless. That's the way. And you know how I know this is, this is possible? Because Jesus showed it can be done. Jesus Christ was falsely accused. Would you think with me about what he experienced? He was falsely accused. He was mercilessly mocked. The only perfect person, the only person who's never sinned, was treated with such degradation such injustice, such abuse. He was illegally beaten and whipped and humiliated, improperly condemned. Talk about a miscarriage of justice. He was condemned by the legal system of his time to die a horrible death on a cross, not for what he had done, but actually he died for what we did. He died for our sins. That is the ultimate injustice. And how did he deal with it? Did he toughen up? Did he call down the legions of angels? Did he smoke the world? Did he, did he level? Did he show them? He prayed a prayer. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. By the way, most people that hurt you and offend you have no clue. If you and I could just take ourselves out of it, that's their issue. They're just doing what they do, and you happen to be there. It's, it makes it a little bit easier if you take yourself out of it to forgive somebody and say, they don't know what they're doing. And to, and to be sympathetic. How many of you have made mistakes when you didn't know what you were doing? So hopefully, uh, the next time you don't know what you're doing, somebody will forgive you. And this is what Jesus is saying. Really, we need to understand each other better. We need to forgive each other better. Here's the last piece of this. Are you getting anything out of this? Number one, we're going to choose to cultivate a Christ-like... We want to be like Jesus. We want to be tender like him. That's how we become unoffendable. And then we want to choose to forgive and be reconciled. And I want to challenge you to make that choice today. If there's somebody that's kind of in your craw right now, you need to release them. You need to sleep good tonight. You need to let it go and just bless them and say, whatever. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. Forgive them. Let that go. And then here's the last piece. Choose to entrust your case to God. Now, you might have a case. You might actually have been wounded, damaged, hurt, offended, abused. You've got probably a solid case. The problem is, as long as you try to work that case to the point, work it through to justice, it's offending you. And what Jesus did was something different, and he left us a powerful example. He entrusted his case into the hands of God. This, this, what happened to him on the cross was immoral. It was unjust. But he refused to be trapped in offense 
because he was, a, he was a love person. He was the definition of love. When you're hurt, the natural question is, well, if I don't fight for myself, if I don't defend myself, if I don't push this, if I don't right this wrong, who's going to do it? And the answer is, give it to God. And it's not, that you, it's not that you don't care anymore about justice. Justice is God's middle name. He is a God of perfect justice. And there's a moment coming. If all else fails, there is that moment coming when all of us will stand before the judge. And I promise you, every wrong will be made right at that point, if not sooner, right? That's making my knees knock just a little bit thinking about it. God is a God of justice, and he would not have it in the other. He's not going to leave a single loose end. This thing ends with perfect justice. That means you can slide your case over onto him because it's destroying you. And leave it in the hands of him who judges justly. First Peter 2, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Lord, help me be like Jesus. It's already hopeless at this point. When he <laughs> suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he what? He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He, so he stood before Pilate and he said, Pilate's telling him, I'm going to get you. You, you. You're a criminal. You, you say you're a king. And Jesus said, your opinion of me is not what's at issue. My identity is established by my father. I'm in his hands. Do what you got to do. You know how secure you will be when you entrust your life, your heart, your soul to Jesus? I don't want you to opt out of this life of serving God, this life of loving people. I don't want you to pack your bags and say, that's it. I've had it with Christians. I've had it with Men, I've had it with women. I can't take it anymore with these kinds of people. I'm done. I'm not helping them anymore. I'm not serving. I'm out. That's exactly what the enemy wants to do. The thousands of people that have said, I'm not doing this. And the enemy just says, oh, that's bullseye right on. But Jesus made a different choice. He said, I will do this. I will forgive. I will lay down my life. I will serve. I will love and I will entrust my soul to my Father. Are you willing to do that? If you are, you have an unoffendable heart. It's a choice you make. It's a battle you fight. We're not gonna get there overnight, but how many would like to have this kind of peace and this kind of heart? A heart of flesh? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. I'm asking, Lord, that you will do surgery in our hearts because we need it. There's some hard places down in there, Lord, things that we're not proud of, hardness toward groups of people, anger, injustice, pain, offenses that have come up in our marriages and in our families and with our neighbors and even in the house of God. Lord, would you fix this mess, Lord? Would you heal us, Lord? Forgive us. Soften our hearts, Lord. And let us, let us be tender toward each other, Lord. Sympathetic toward another person's experience, viewpoint. I pray for people that are sick in their bodies right now. stomach problems, irritable bowel problems, migraine headaches, because something's stuck in their craw. Lord, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the hardness of sin and brokenness in this world. Teach us to rise above that. Heal us, Lord, deeply. I pray for people who struggle to forgive. It's hard It feels like a loss. It feels like a total defeat to forgive somebody, to let the case go. It feels like exactly the wrong thing to do. But God, 
You've called us to forgive. Help us to release, Lord. Help us to forgive. And let peace come back into our beds, Lord. Let health come back into our bodies, Lord. Let our marriages and our friendships and our relationships reflect that tenderness of heart that only comes from knowing Jesus. Every Christian praying right now, just where you are with the Holy Spirit, allow God to just tenderize your heart. Just surrender your heart and say, Lord, tenderize my heart. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you've never taken that step to say, I want to turn my life over to him. I can't do this by myself. I want to follow love. I want to be forgiven. I want to learn how to live. I need a new life. You can have that today. It's a simple choice that you make. It's the Lord loves you so much. He'll do the rest, but he just needs your permission. He can change a life. He really can. He can heal you. He can give you a heart of flesh, a tender heart. But you just have to say, I'm making the choice today for Jesus. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you and help you. I would never embarrass you. But while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if that's you and you'd like me to pray for you for a brand new start in life and for a brand new relationship with Jesus, I'd love to see your hand and know who I'm praying for. If that's you, just slip up your hand. No one's watching. Just right where you are, I see you. I see your hand as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's about six people on one side three people over there. Just another moment. Every Christian praying, thank you, dear. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your hand. I see that. See, what happens is we hear the good news of God's forgiveness, and then we just want to say yes. We just, it's the easiest thing to say yes to love. Once you find out God's not angry, yes, sir, I see you in the back. I want to be forgiven. So, Lord, I pray for these nine people whose hands are raised. I ask you to touch them in a special way. Give them exactly what they need in their life today. Heal them, forgive them, give them that beautiful gift of new life through Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross for our sins. That was real, and we receive it, and we, we rejoice in it. We thank you for it. Let this be real for each of them today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everyone just look at me. I'd like to say a prayer, and this would be a prayer that all of us would pray, especially those of you that raise your hands because something big is happening in your life. I remember when I raised my hand to say, I'm giving my heart to Christ. I mean, it went deep and it was real for me. And God changed my life and he's changing your life. And I could, I could wish I could just throw it at you and you'd have it, but you've got to open your heart through prayer. We're all going to say a prayer because it just feels good to pray out loud. And let's do that and lift up this prayer to the Lord. Could we all say this prayer? Here we go. Father God, thank you for the peace and healing you offer. Forgive me for allowing offense to harden my heart. I ask you to, you know, that is so good. I just want to say it again. Let's do it again. I ask you to soften my heart and teach me to follow Jesus daily into life and peace in Christ's name. There were nine hands that I counted this morning where people were saying, that's me. I'm... Thank you, Jesus. I want to ask you if, you if you were one of those nine hands or if you're online, I didn't see your hand, or if you're in the cafe. Uh, if you're here in the auditorium, there's a decision card that says, I've decided. I'd love to hear what happened today in your life. Just take a pen, fill out that card in a minute. The offering's going to come by. If you're watching online or in the cafe, you can, you can get a card in the cafe online. You can send us an email, info at gccsj.com. Let us know the decision that you've made. The offering's coming by. I'd love to hear about your, the change that you're experiencing in your life, the decision that you've made. So fill that out. The worship team's going to come. We're going to have a few minutes of just kind of Holy Spirit time, worshiping. During that time, the offering container will come by. And if you're prompted to give today, that'd be wonderful. But please drop your cards in. Let us know how we can connect with you, all right? I'll be back in just a minute. Let's worship the Lord together. There's no other name. There's no other name like yours. Jesus, sing it out. Like yours, Jesus.
worship you. No one like you, Lord. No one like you, Lord. I almost hate for this to be over because it's just so right to be in God's presence. Church is really about connecting. And uh, why don't you join me and stand together? We're going to close the service. I will close. I don't want to, but I'm going to. Church is really all about connecting. And the friends that you see here in the front are people that elders, intercessors, ministers, leaders that can help you and pray for you. If you need healing prayer, if you just want to check in with somebody, they're here. You don't have to rush off and remain anonymous. You can get engaged. All the information you heard about in the service earlier, you can connect with that in the lobby. Information about ministries and outreaches you heard about. Get connected, all right? And I'm going to pray a blessing over you. And this is the one I'm thinking of, peace. The kind of peace that lets you sleep, The kind of peace that gets you where you're not fussing anymore. The kind of peace that takes that knot out of your stomach. The kind of peace that can only come from knowing that your sins are washed away. Would you lift your hands and just receive God's peace as I bless you? Father, I ask that that promised peace, that great peace, that unexplainable peace, that irrational peace, would drop down like dew on your people, Lord. That you would water us with the deepest peace. Lord, we release our offenses. We forgive those who have damaged us, who don't understand us. We release it all, and we receive your peace. We receive healing in our bodies, and thanking you now for healing in our relationships, Lord. Let our friendships flourish. Let our marriages go to another level. Because we're dropping our beef and we're receiving your peace. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I felt that. That seemed real to me. Let's rejoice for that. (laughs) I love every one of you. Hey, if I haven't met you, Kathy and I would love to just say hello to you. Come up and say hello to us. If you need prayer, join the folks here at the front. God bless you. You're dismissed.